and welcome to our last lecture on the Gospel of Matthew, part one. And today, we're going to discuss the final teachings of the Sermon on the Mount, and we're also going to discuss how Jesus shows us, gives us the example of how to live out the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount. So among the last teachings of the Sermon on the Mount are some that are very difficult to understand and sort of very difficult for us to think how we can live lives following these rules. And what he does is he actually takes uh, two of the Ten Commandments and sort of constricts them, and then takes one of the laws that we might think is merciful and uh, constricts that as well. And that is one that we'll talk about in just a minute that we need to understand in the manner in which Jesus meant it. Okay, the first law of the Ten Commandments that Jesus constricts is the commandment that says, thou shalt not murder. And indeed, in some translations, you will hear, hear that it says, thou shalt not kill. But from the original Hebrew, the word actually is murder. And so that is obviously the intent to commit and, and the actual committing of an unlawful killing. And so when G Jesus says, thou, you have all heard, thou shalt, come on, shalt not murder, but I say, you shall not even be angry with your brother and he lists what will happen what what will happen as a person demonstrates anger at their brother meaning their fellow citizen not just a relative uh, but they will be uh, sent before the Sanhedrin and a Sanhedrin is a council a religious council and every town had one and you will be liable to the fires of Gehenna. And Gehenna is a metaphor for uh, the fiery place in the afterlife where wicked people would spend eternity. And that's our vision of hell as well. That's where we get that vision of hell. And we think, but gosh, we get angry at people, and, and certainly Jesus is not talking about righteous anger, right? He himself demonstrated righteous anger when he cleansed the temple. Uh, he drove out, I, the Bible actually says he drove out the money changers and the sellers in the temple. And in the Gospel of John, he, they even say he used a whip. I mean, this is, wow, that's anger. Is Jesus now subject to Gehenna? Of course not. Righteous anger is not what Jesus is referring to. And he's even not referring to when we snap at someone because we've got a lot going on, we're stressed or we're irritated. This person has done the same thing over and over and over again, and it just finally got on our nerves. What Jesus is, re or even having a conflict, a debate with someone, and it kind of gets a little heated. What Jesus is talking about is the anger that leads to violence, that will lead to murder. So he's talking about the road rage that drives us to the point where we're ready to hit that person with our car because they cut in front of us and how dare they. It's not that when we say, perhaps, a few words we shouldn't have said, or uh, just think to ourselves, wow, that big jerk, they, what right did they think? Are they on the whole road? And then we let it go. Uh, it's probably better that we try to be calm. I have a wonderful friend, and when people cut in front of her, she says, welcome to my lane. I think, oh, I need to be a saint like she is. So usually I, try, I, I end up saying, you big fat jerk, Welcome to my lane. <laughs> I can't quite do one by itself, but I try to do both. And the point is that we need to release our anger and not let it consume us to where we will get violent. 
uh, we can't get in a dispute with our neighbor about the fact that they mow their lawn at 5 a.m. on a Saturday morning uh, and go over there and start getting into such a heated, angry argument with them uh, that's it's going to turn violent, especially when people have guns handy. You always hear about that, right? Neighbors shooting each other over this kind of dispute. That's the anger Jesus is talking about. That kind, or letting anger fester within us until we're ready to kill somebody and we think about it. It's like, oh, wouldn't it be nice? Just how would I get away with it? Uh, whatever. That's the kind of anger Jesus is talking about, the, the roots of violence, which is anger. So it's not just the everyday snapping or losing our temper, which again, yes, we must examine our consciences and make amends for to that person and then to God and really try to resolve to remain calmer when we can and, and praying and keeping... Uh, trying to look at the good and the positive in our lives, especially now that they're so stressful. All those things can help us step back and not be so short-tempered. But it's really, again, being so frustrated with our kids that we just want to smack them. Uh, no, then we need to know. Let's have a time out. Mommy's going in her room for a minute, <laughs> right? <laughs> Mommy needs a time out. Daddy needs a time out. These are, again, the roots of violence is what Jesus is talking about when he says you cannot even be angry. It's the anger that leads to violence. Then the next one Jesus said is uh, when you have heard, do not commit adultery, I say any man, any man who looks at a woman with lust in his heart has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And I'll never forget, I was sitting in mass with my children and my 15 year old, my son who was 15 at the time was sitting next to me and they read that at the gospel. And all of a sudden my 15 year old son's head whipped around to look at me with this expression of outright horror on his face because you better believe there isn't a 15 year old boy on the planet who isn't looking at people with lust in their hearts right they're looking at furniture with lust in their hearts they're 15 year old boys their hormones have run them up and he's staring at me he's like mom mom and, and i say honey I'll explain it in the car. And he's just shaking <laughs> and so clearly traumatized through the rest of Matt. And I have to keep patting his hand saying, I'll explain in the car. I'll explain in the car. <laughs> Bless his heart. And I finally explained in the car what I'm going to explain to you now. <laughs> And I still think the trauma kind of lingered with him, with him for some time afterwards. But it was so adorable. I mean, just the look on his face. Big, and, and probably the look on a lot of people's faces when they hear this. Because it makes a lot of people feel bad about being human. We're human beings. Part of us is uh, our sexuality. That's, uh, and cer we're certainly nosy about everybody else's sexuality, aren't we? And God made us this way. It wasn't like somehow this popped into us in original sin or some such thing. No, not at all. God made us this way, right? That's, that's how we have babies and babies are joyful. And it's uh, Jesus, the Jews of Jesus's time, and Jesus would have agreed with this, was that marital love was a wedding gift that God gave the couple to help them weather through the hard times of marriage. It was, it, it's integrated into who we are. And it's part of the creation of God that God said was very good. So 
then what does Jesus mean by this? Jesus means that, yes, of course, all of us at some time or other in our lives will see a person and say, wow, that person's super attractive. They're really sexy. And that's okay. That doesn't mean we plan on leaving our partners and running off with this other person. Of course not. That doesn't mean somehow our nature is in innately corrupt and evil and base and bestial. No, no, it means we're human. What Jesus is talking about here is when we look at another person and a couple of things happen. Either we obsess about this person, right, and only think about having sex with this person and how can we have an affair with that person. Jesus is definitely talking about that as a, that's adultery in the heart because we're thinking actually about committing adultery with this person, but also thinking about another person as an object, as a body part, as something to make, uh, give us pleasure. And that's all they are. They're not a human being. They don't have feelings of their own. They don't, they, they, it, what they want doesn't even matter because all they are is some thing, some part to give us pleasure. That's what Jesus means. That's the sin. That's the crime, right? And, and not to pick on the gentleman, but there, I guarantee you there is not a woman here speak, that I am speaking to who has not had some creepy experience with some guy somewhere, sometime, right? We've all been followed in a store by some creepy guy. We've all been, uh, probably all had some story of some kind of sexual assault, whether it was a guy rubbing up against us, all the way to the horror of being raped. All of us have had that experience, and that is the kind of sin Jesus is speaking against. And men have had these experiences. Men have been groped. Men have been raped. It, 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 it's not reserved just for women to have experienced. It's just more commonly happens to women. But it's not like, I, I don't want to leave gentlemen out because I know gentlemen have been abused. Um, so all of this is what Jesus is talking about. He's not talking about the average person going, dang, they're hot, whoa, and then moving on with life. <laughs> That's normal. That's healthy. They're, don't feel bad. Don't sit there and go, I'm a bad person. There's something wrong with me for noticing and for having those feelings and momentarily and then moving on. What's worse is hating ourselves because then we obsess. Let it go. That's okay. And then the next one that has been so painful and so difficult for people even to this day are his teachings on divorce. Where, but, and this comes up twice in the Gospel of Matthew, both here and then later in chapter 19, where uh, Jesus first instigates it himself in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And then later in chapter 19, some religious leaders approach him and say, is it lawful to divorce your wife? Because in the law of Moses, it, it is lawful, there's a procedure, uh, and at the time of Jesus, other prominent rabbis said it was okay. And at the time of Jesus, only men could initiate divorce, except under certain conditions, uh, and uh, generally if the woman was either extremely persistent or extremely eloquent or probably was a fairly prominent woman. And in those cases, and they're very rare, but we have found documentation, a woman could sway the Sanhedrin in her town. And then usually the pressure, but the man still had to, insti had to initiate it, but they could put pressure on the man of daily fines. And actually some men were so stubborn, they would be bankrupted before they would give their wives a divorce but the man still had to initiate it 
the wife could never initiate it, though at the time of Jesus. The husband still had to do it, but pressure could be put on him to do it. But he could still refuse. And so Jesus, so people are saying, well, gee, we're, that's allowed. And so Jesus, by saying, no, you're not allowed to divorce your wife, is trying to protect women in the sense that only men could do it. And there was one prominent rabbi at his time who said, yes, men can divorce their wives and they can divorce them for trivial reasons. If she burnt his meal, he could divorce her. In a time where women could not receive alimony, did not receive alimony, did not, had no ability to go and get a job. They could not sell if they had a skill. They could not go to the marketplace and just set up a little stall saying, hey, here are, you know, here are Sarah's little weavings or pottery. No, you couldn't do that. The, uh, the male sellers would drive her out of the marketplace. She couldn't do that. Maybe she could do it kind of on the black market among other women who might be willing to support her if their husbands didn't find out or if their husbands were nice enough. But no, she couldn't do that. Uh, she probably couldn't keep her kids or if she did keep her kids, how was she going to feed them unless she was really attractive and young, maybe she could get another husband. Otherwise, if she was attractive and young, she could be a prostitute. If not, she may be someone in her family. Maybe her father would take her back. Uh, maybe some other relatives grudgingly would let her be in their household, but probably as a divorced woman, unlikely. So she could beg and slowly starve on the streets. Those were her choices. So you can see why Jesus is so strict, saying, don't you do that to your wife. Don't you leave that woman to be a prostitute or to starve. Now, then we think, but what about abusive situations? Wouldn't it be better for a woman to be able to leave an abusive situation and then run to another town where no one knows her or make a new life somewhere, get a new identity? Isn't that better? But Jesus lived in an honor-shame society. And honor-shame societies are where your public reputation means everything. And that's why even to this day we hear about the horror of honor shame, honor killings, right? Where a woman in a culture is considered usually a daughter to have brought shame on the family by dating the wrong person or some such thing. And the, fam the males in the family kill her because she has brought shame upon the family. Well, the reason the men feel they need to do this is because ev they feel everyone in the society is looking down on them because of the behavior of this woman in the family because they care so much what everyone else in their society thinks of them. Now, that's, uh, that's a horrible thing. That's wrong. That's horrible. But uh, flipping it over, if a man is beating his wife and mistreating her and starving her and raping her and doing all these awful things to her, everyone, in, especially in the small town, knows what's going on. And they would consider that shameful behavior. And they would let that man know they think less of him. Now, we might think in the West today, yeah, right, that no one, so what's that going to do? But I have, I, I know an, a man, a priest from India, and I discussed this issue with him because India is an honor-shame culture. And I asked him about this issue, and I said, do you really mean to tell me that if there was a man in your parish 
who was abusing his wife, beating her, drinking, mistreating her. Um, and you found out about it and you knew, all the parishioners knew about it or they came to you and told you, you could go to that man's house and tell him that everyone knew he was doing this and he needed to stop and he would stop and that would work. And he said, yes, I have done that many times and it always works. Wow. So we have to understand that in Jesus's time, especially in small places where everyone knows everyone else's business, and even in Jerusalem, in the synagogues that people would attend, those were all rather close-knit places. People knew. And the officials, the synagogue leaders, or the Pharisee, the local Pharisee, would go and tell these guys, stop it. We all know, and no one likes you. No one thinks highly of you. You're an awful man, and we all know it, and no one's going to do business with you, and we think you're a fool and an idiot, and God is angry with you because you treat your wife like that. And he would stop, or he would hide it better. But as a general rule, he would stop. So by forbidding divorce in his time, Jesus was accomplishing something positive for women. Now, how do we take that, those teachings and apply them to ourselves, right? Because we can't just say, well, then Jesus just spoke to those people and we can ignore the word of Jesus because then how do we take anything Jesus said seriously, right? Well, I don't like this and I don't like that. Uh, we can't do that with the Bible, right? We can't say, well, I like this teaching of Jesus, so I'm going to ignore it. Uh, no, it doesn't work that way, right? right? We take it all, we take nothing. So we take it all. But then how do we apply that to today? where that doesn't work, right? Where you couldn't go into even your sister's house and tell her husband, how dare you? We couldn't even go to our brother's house, right? And say, how dare you treat your wife like that? You stop at this instant. He's gonna throw us out of his house, right? Cops frequently aren't able to stop, right? The guy goes to jail, he gets out, he goes back to his behavior or he kills his wife. How does this work for us? Well, when we continue to read what Jesus says, especially in chapter 19, he talks about the ideal of what was created in the garden, that perfect right relationship, right, that the couple had in the garden. And that is our ideal. Now, obviously, when the man and the woman in the garden sinned, when they lost faith with God and broke that relationship with God, and then from there broke the relationship with each other, right? They realized they were naked and they hid from each other. They put on clothing. They were ashamed of being with each other completely naked, meaning not only physically, but emotionally and spiritually and intellectually. And all of a sudden they were having secrets, all of that. And this was all consequence of sin, not God's will. Now all of us have relationships that are not perfect. I mean, the perfect sacramental marriage with someone in the garden. Now, no one has a perfect sacramental marriage, but we all need to be working, right, towards that ideal. However, there are some marriages that clearly are so broken that they are no longer even to be considered sacramental marriages, and those are marriages of abuse. Whether it's physical abuse, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, financial abuse, verbal abuse, you, it's abuse. And that relationship is so broken, it, is no, it, it can't even work towards that ideal. There's, it, it's too broken, it's one partner is being so abused, it, it, safety. Jesus needs that safety for that person. 
and then this rule of divorce doesn't even count because it's not sacramental. Perhaps it never was sacramental. And that, then these rules about divorce don't apply because Jesus is only talking about marriages working towards the sacramental ideal. And these, mar these types of relationships can't work to the sacramental ideal. They just can't. However, Jesus, and abandonment, same thing, right? We, most states in this country have no-fault divorce. Your spouse house often leaves you and divorces you. There's nothing you can do. And Jesus, in the same way, says, well, the sacramental part's gone. There's no way to work towards a sacramental marriage in those cases. And then the abandoned spouse is free to move on towards a sacramental marriage. That's what Jesus would feel. And so what Jesus is speaking about are those marriages where people get bored, where they feel the marriage is stale. Well, I don't really love my spouse anymore. Ah, oh, I think we just grew apart. Those are the marriages Jesus talks about and says, those ones perk it up perk it up, don't you get a divorce, work on it, come back to that marriage, get counseling, get what it fired up, whatever you need to do, fix that marriage and start work, go back and start working towards that sacramental ideal. That's what Jesus is talking about. No one's going to reach it, right? Because we, we, there's that wall between the garden of us. There's that guarded gate between that pure sacramental relationship and us. But it doesn't mean that we're all not supposed to. So that's what Jesus is talking about. It, it's not this complete lack of help for people in abusive situations. No, 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 not at all. He's talking about sacramental marriages only. At the end of Jesus's teachings of the Sermon on the Mount, he says something very disturbing. He says, at the end, many will cry, Lord, Lord, and I will say, I do not know you. And they will say, but I prophesied in your name. I healed people in your name. I cast out demons in your name. And I will say, and, and Jesus is continuing to say, I will say to you, I never knew you. Get away from me, you evildoers. And that's shocking. Why would Jesus say such a thing, right? People are doing all these good deeds and they're doing them in the name of Jesus. Why would Jesus cast them away? And it's, there's this great line from a verse play by T.S. Eliot called Murder in the Cathedral. And it's a dramatization, it's a verse dramatization on the life or the death of uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, St. Thomas of Eckett, uh, who was in conflict with Henry II in the 1100s and in England. And he, there, there's a line that Thomas of Eckett says, and obviously this is all fictionalized, but it's a great line that I think helps us understand what Jesus means by this statement, which is the greatest treason is the great, I, I might be misquoting it, but I'm, I have it correctly in my notes, but it's the greatest betrayal is the greatest treason to do the right thing for the wrong reason. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. Are people, these people who have prophesied in Jesus' name, people who have healed 
in Jesus' name, people who have cast out demons in Jesus' name. Why did they do it? Did they do it for their own aggrandizement, their own fame, their own glory? Did they do it for money? Did they do it not to bring the kingdom of God in the world, but actually to get power to not further the kingdom of God, but actually to bring evil into the world? Did they do it for fraud so they could just steal from people? There are all kinds of reasons people can be, quote unquote, doing good. But it's for the wrong reason. And that's what Jesus is talking about. So after all these teachings, Jesus says it's not even enough to follow the law, so to speak. Your heart has to be in the right place. Your mind has to be in the right place. Just as Jesus has had to be when after his baptism, he had to go into the desert first thing and face temptation. In the same way, okay, we have our rules, so to speak. We have our guidelines of how to be a good disciple of Jesus. Now we have to get our hearts and our minds focused. Everything we should be doing is for the glory of God and for bringing the kingdom into the world. That's why we should be doing it. And then Jesus makes it even worse in a way by telling us, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring this sword. Families will be torn apart. They will be against each other. And only if you do not prefer me, Jesus, to mother, father, son, daughter, you are not worthy of me. That's harsh. That's harsh, right? We look to our families for support, right? We would die for our kids, right? Suddenly, it's like, no, Jesus has to be first. And if our kids disagree with us, or our kids, what we're doing endangers our kids. Uh, for example, uh, just always using kind of the hardest example, but you lived in Nazi Germany. Are you going to hide Jewish people in your homes? You have kids in your house. If the Nazis find the Jews in your house, all of you go to the prison camp. All of you go to Auschwitz. Even your little kids. That's scary. That's hard. If you really can imagine yourself there. That's scary. And that's what Jesus asks us to do. In where, wherever we are standing up for social justice. Another example that perhaps seems a little less life-threatening. Uh, I know a gentleman who's a Mennonite, and Mennonites are, uh, if you're not familiar with them, they're like the Amish, except they use electricity. <laughs> and modern conveniences would be the best example. But they have that similar uh, nonviolent philosophy. Uh, they believe in mission. They believe in going out and living their faith. Uh, they're very uh, nice people. Uh, they have, uh, they don't speak another language or anything, but their faith is related to the Amish faith in terms of the kinds of things they believe as Christians. Anyway, this young man, nicest, one of the nicest guys I ever met, he became a physician and he got married and he, to another woman who was a Marin, uh, Mennonite, I believe she might have been a nurse, and they went to one of the poorest Navajo reservations in New Mexico and lived. He served as their doctor 
and he lived in the same type of housing that the Navajo lived in. So he didn't have a floor. He had a dirt floor. He had no running water. He and his wife, they had no electricity. And they had two kids. And they lived there for 15 years with their kids in abject poverty, serving the Navajo people as Navajo. And when they finally left, and I think they finally left so their children could go to college. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Navajo culture, but the, the Navajo people as a culture do not, or at least this group of Navajo people, did, were not uh, externally emotionally expressive. Uh, it's not to say that they don't feel emotions, but in public, they are, uh, they just don't, they don't smile a lot. They never cry in public. You know, they're just kind of calm. They, they maintain this sort of serious, calm demeanor in public. When he left, they cried. They cried publicly because they said he was the first outsider Usually, like, people would come to serve them for a year or two, and they never felt that that was a true commitment. This guy stayed with his family and his children for 15 years and had become one of them. And when he left, they cried. They, they encircled him and embraced him and his wife and his kids. And that was someone who loved, and his wife, I'm not trying to demean his wife, I just didn't personally know her, but he and his wife put Jesus ahead of their parents and of their children because they served other people as disciples of Jesus, the least of Jesus' brothers and sisters. Native Americans in poverty as Jesus commanded us. So this is what Jesus means when he says this. You've got to put it all on the line. However, and when I talk about social justice, there's social justice everywhere. I mean, I think we do need to address uh, the racism right now in terms of that's a current issue, but it doesn't necessarily mean, um, you know, there are, uh, there are links to uh, things the bishops have been saying and things the bishops have been doing, but it doesn't need necessarily mean to be our, um, our lifelong devotion, shall we say. It certainly needs to be addressed right now, but there, is, there are social justice needs everywhere. Right uh, there was this gentleman and his wife for the Native Americans. There are people, there are hungry children. There are um, widowed people who, you know, elderly people who need care and are abandoned. I mean, it's limited. There are uh, different people being discriminated against. There are, I, I mean, I could go on and on. There's social justice needs everywhere. And of course, with shelter in place, we are more limited in what we can do. But if you go on the internet, you can look. It's everywhere. Everywhere. And that's what Jesus calls us to do. And in our limited circumstances, we can still find out what we can still accomplish. And that, and, and not doing anything is not what we are called to accomplish. We are a called to act because we are Jesus' hands and feet and mouths. And then just as Jesus has told us now how to be disciples, he shows us. He goes out and heals. He heals lepers. He heals the slave of a centurion. And make no mistake about it, I think our translations say servant. That word always means, it means either 
it means dependent. So it means either son or slave. Uh, and it's interesting that we usually use the translation slave because paisan means dependent. Someone who is utterly dependent on him. So I find it very interesting that we translate that almost always as slave or servant. And it's certainly someone, though, that he is so devoted to. It could be his child. I just find it interesting that that's how we translate it. But be that as it may, Jesus heals this man, an outcast, uh, the person this man asks to be healed. Uh, and then there's that beautiful story of uh, the twin healings of the woman with a hemorrhage and the official's dying daughter who dies. And what it shows is not only Jesus's compassion to women and to outcasts, right, who cares about a bleeding woman or a dead girl, right, in the society that venerates boys and males, but also not only does he restore them to their societies, to their families, but he restores them to life, literally and figuratively, right? The little girl is, brought, is resuscitated and brought back to life, and the hemorrhaging woman is figuratively brought back to life because now she can reclaim her place in society, uh, possibly marry, uh, and they're restored to their life-giving abilities. Right, the little girl can now grow up and have, get married and have children. This woman can either have children herself or go back and enjoy the children that maybe she has already had or the family uh, with children. And so it's all about life giving. The, these twin stories are a beautiful one about life giving. And then there's Jesus healing communities, right? He heals. Uh, or he calms the storm, which in effect is a healing, right? It's a healing of nature. It's a healing of the anger of nature, right? Even though uh, the Sea of Galilee to this day has these horrible squalls that just come up, has something to do obviously with the geography of the Sea of Galilee. But, uh, and it was one of the things that made fishing on the Sea of Galilee so difficult or traveling across it. And I love the image of Jesus asleep on the boat, right? So many times we're in turmoil and it's like, Jesus is asleep on the boat. Wake up, Jesus, and save me. I know I feel that way a lot. But also that Jesus takes care of his community in toil. And then you have the community of the paralytic, the man who is paralyzed, and his community carries him in to be healed by Jesus. So you see Jesus saves his community and recognizes the saving power of our communities, right? Because we so need our communities to support us in our difficult times. Uh, even now, you know, if you are in trouble, uh, your friends can leave food at your door, right? Send you a gift card through the mail. Uh, there are things people can still do for you in the shelter in place time. And we need our community to do that. And sadly, we can't have our big communal gatherings like weddings and funerals, which are a terrible loss to us, or graduations. But we can find new ways for our communities to support us. And we need to do that because that community is so healing. And that's something that Jesus recognized. Then we have this most bizarre, bizarre story, which is Jesus has been casting out demons. And these Pharisees come up. And you can tell they are grasping at straws to attack Jesus. They, they are grasping at straws. They're upset with Jesus. 
And they're, they're not even thinking clearly. And they say, ah, oh, Jesus, you are casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub. And Beelzebub was another term for the devil. And it's sort of like, say what? Have you guys been out in the sun too long? Really, really. He's casting out demons by the power of the devil. But the demons work for the devil. But the, he's just... It's so illogical, right? It's so illogical. You can even imagine the crowd sort of scratching their heads, going, wait, wait, I'm trying to follow this logic, and, and I, it's not computing here. And Jesus, of course, just immediately gets on them for that and says, a house divided cannot stand right. Duh. <laughs> But then he goes on and says something that Christians have dreaded since the moment Jesus said it, no doubt, which is there is one unforgivable sin. And of course, we've always been raised, but we can go to reconciliation and be forgiven for anything. <gasps> But there's something Jesus said was unforgivable. What if I commit that sin by accident and I won't be forgiven? Oh, I mean, I as a kid was always bothered by that too. I, it's scary. It's terrifying. <sighs> Breathe. It's okay. It can't, for one thing, the unforgivable sin cannot be committed accidentally. The unforgivable sin is, I'm just going to look for my notes because I had the perfect quote, and I want to make sure I get it exactly. But basically, the most unforgivable, the only unforgivable sin is thinking that what comes from God is evil. And the reason it's unforgivable is that if you think what comes from God is evil. You are rejecting the only thing that can save you. And that's why it's unforgivable. Because it's not that God is not forgiving you. It's you're rejecting the only thing that can save you. That's the unforgivable forgivable sin. So you can see why it's not something you're committing by accident or you're somehow being misled into committing. It's the deliberate act of saying that everything that comes, from, and it's got to be everything that comes from God. It can't be like, I don't know, that sounds funky. I don't know. It's everything. It's saying, it's believing every single thing that is good and right in the world, nature, beauty, the love anyone tries to give you, a righteous act, kindness, everything, every single thing that is of God. You know, not just religion or faith or, you know, miracles. It's every single thing that comes from God, leaving nothing out, <laughs> no room. Every single thing that comes from God, believing it is evil. That is the unforgivable sin. And it is unforgivable because that is all that offers you salvation. So I hope that's clear and can relieve you <laughs> and realize there are very, 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 very few times anyone has ever committed this sin, if at all, <laughs> right? Because that would be a lot of effort to really find God nowhere. You know, even if you're an atheist, to never even think, wow, that's a good and right act. That's, that's still... 
Even if you're not calling it God, that's finding God somewhere, right? So, yeah. You have to try hard. Now, the next, after this weird encounter and this formerly scary uh, thought or teaching, Jesus goes to a strange place to kind of get his, or what we would think would get his mind together, because it does say Jesus retreated into the area of Tyre and Sidon. And that is Gentile territory. And so you would think, wow, he's fighting about cleanliness and, oh, oh, that's right. Sorry. He then goes on, uh, more Pharisees come and complain that his disciples don't ritually wash their hands before they eat. And this is not a, like, ew, germ, icky issue. It's, it's about ritual. It's about ritual cleansing. And Jesus says that, it tells them, you have it all wrong. It's not about eating unclean things. It's not about what goes into your body. It's what's already in your heart that comes out of your mouth. So it's about preaching unclean things. It's about saying unclean things to others. That's where true purity and cleanness lie, in your intentions, in your thoughts, in your actions. And so after this big debate, right? First he's been accused of being working with Satan, and then he's accused of being unclean and letting his disciples be unclean. And obviously, these are very stressful. It kind of goes to the heart of being Jewish and a faithful Jewish person. He, and and the Greek actually says, he retreats. But he retreats to Gentile territory. Seems a little odd, because he goes to, like, the most unclean place he could go, short of a pigsty. (laughs) And many Jews thought all Gentile territory was a pigsty anyway. So it seems rather odd. And then he has the most, it's the most horrifying story about Jesus, right, we've ever heard. The most appalling story about Jesus, where this poor Canaanite woman approaches him, a Gentile woman, and begs for his mercy for his daughter, for her daughter rather, who is suffering greatly, tormented greatly by an evil spirit. She's possessed. This poor young girl is possessed by a demon. And she asks, she she names Jesus son of David. She treats him respectfully and begs him to heal her daughter. And Jesus is unbelievably rude to her. He first ignores her and then says, we don't feed the food of the children to the dogs. He calls her a dog. Is Jesus taking all this out on her? I mean, he has healed women. He has healed possessed people. He has healed Gentiles. He has healed possessed Gentiles. What is going on with Jesus? This is not the loving, wonderful Jesus we know. This is not the Jesus he just taught people to be in the Sermon on the Mount. What is going on? Has he been out in the sun too long? I mean, seriously, this is the most appalling and revolting story about our Lord. And it only appears in the Gospel of Matthew. Now that tells us something. That tells us something right there, that this story is important for the particular community of the gospel of Matthew. And what do we know about that community? That community was primarily made of Jewish followers of Jesus. And there was a minority of Gentile followers of Jesus. So, Both communities were pretty patriarchal. 
they both didn't quite know the place of women. However, in the Jewish followers, among the Jewish followers of Jesus, there were more places for women. There had already been prominent women leading Eucharist. Uh, there were prominent, uh, you know, Priscilla was a prominent evangelist with Paul. There already were places for prominent women. Gentiles were not keen on prominent women preachers, number one. And the Jewish community, therefore, might not have been very keen on Gentile women telling them about Jesus. So, this story is designed not to pick on Jesus, not even to show Jesus being a meanie and reinforcing the biases in Matthew's community. Instead, it is there to put them in their place and show Jesus being impressed by the tenacity and the wisdom of and the cleverness of this woman, this Gentile woman, who does not let Jesus' insults bother her and who does not let Jesus' pushing her aside bother her, but came up with such quick and smart retorts and showed such deep faith that Jesus pointed to her as an example. So this story is not about Jesus having bad behavior. It's about Jesus being, it's like, wow, even Jesus was impressed by the words and the attitude and the faith of a Gentile woman. We in Matthew's community don't get to shut up Gentile women who wish to speak about Jesus. That's what that story is about. And the grace she received from Jesus was more, I mean, we don't even know the tone of voice Jesus used, which may well have been kind of joking between them in the sense that they're harsh words, but she might not have, I mean, we don't know his expression. You know how friends kind of tease each other and say nasty things, but we, you know, they don't mean them. That's my take on it, is that Jesus, it was sort of something between the two of them. And she just kept one-upping him, and he was letting her, and then praised her for being able to sort of win that verbal sparring between them, as opposed to he's really like, you nasty dog, get away, you Gentile dog, you, which is how it seems to us. And a lot of scholars will say, see, she taught Jesus something. No, no, it was more, I see it more as kind of a banter, but it was a banter there to be an example to all you bigoted members of Matthew's community. And what it teaches us today is that we don't, we need to let go of our biases, bring down the walls that we have erected that keep the voices of others out. And we need to listen and we need to respect people who can speak the word of God, who we might not expect to be able to. And we might think, you don't belong, you don't belong, right? We're, we're often about who doesn't belong. And Jesus is all about moving the fences, moving the fences further back, further back, letting more people in. That's what this story is about. And I'm just going to conclude, well, I'll conclude there. There's more in my notes, but I think that's what we need to realize, that to be true disciples of Christ, we do need, and Jesus says, pick up our crosses, but our crosses are the crosses 
of the cost of discipleship. It's not about, oh, I have chronic pain, I'll carry that cross, or oh, I have this conflict, or I have a job I don't like, or I'm having money troubles, or I, my house burnt down. Those aren't the crosses Jesus means. He means the cross of the cost of discipleship. And discipleship is a big cross. And that's okay because Jesus helps us carry us and we will always, Jesus will always be with us and that cross is worth 